Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a handout oh, for the committee. We can pass that up as well. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Robert Brown, and I am a nationally known constitutional scholar. I produced numerous courses on the U.S. Constitution, and I often get called out to different parts of the country to speak on them. And there's nothing I love more than to speak on the original intent of the Constitution. One of my greatest regrets, I guess you could say, this topic of the Article 5 Convention, as we've seen, oftentimes puts people who should otherwise be allies at odds with each other. And that deeply saddens me, because in so many ways, those on both sides of the, the argument have the same objectives. In fact, I want to go to a, a quote from Justice Scalia where he says, I attack ideas, not people. And there are a lot of really good people with really bad ideas. If you can't separate the bad idea from the good people, maybe you're in the wrong business. I like to take the opportunity to meet my opponents, shake their hand, and you know, other than this one issue, <laughs> we probably agree on most things. On the topic of the Article 5 Convention, just as kind of a, a housekeeping measure here. The term constitutional convention is often used, but it's also often rejected. That uh, those promoting a convention up until about the last 10 years use this term as well, freely. And only in the last few years have they started saying, oh no, this is not a constitutional convention. Uh, call me old fashioned, but I tend to like to use words according to their definitions. So I, I brought with me my copy of Black's Law's Dictionary, which what it says of a constitutional convention, the actual definition it gives. A duly constituted assembly of delegates or representatives of the people or state of nation for the purpose of framing, revising, or amending its constitution. So a constitutional convention could be one drafting a new constitution, could be one amending an existing one, revising one. Now notably, most law dictionaries in the country also include the following. As an example of an article, or excuse me, as an example of this term, constitutional convention, it says, Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution provides that a constitutional convention may be called on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the state. What's the point here? By definition, an Article 5 convention is a constitutional convention. The reason that's important is because so much in history and case law refers to it as a constitutional convention. And if we don't believe they're the same thing, you start to miss some of that history. So what I want to address today, just to give a simple summary here, oh, one other point here is that those that are claiming this is not a constitutional convention, I've asked them repeatedly, can you give me a source for that? Can you give me an unbiased, authoritative definition of this term, constitutional convention? that does not include the Article 5 Convention? And the answer has always been the same. It's to change the subject because they don't have any source. There is nothing that says any other definition. And so just setting that aside, that term does apply here whether or not they want to use it. And the main reason they don't want to is there's a lot of baggage with it. A lot of people have a negative connotation to the idea of a constitutional convention. That's a dangerous thing. And I would agree, rightly so, actually. Anyway, to begin now, my overview of what I want to talk about, three major points. First of all, history. There's been a lot of history discussed today, and my point is that's not really what happened. I'll get into that in some detail. What is the purpose of the Article 5 Convention? It's been discussed a little bit. We'll, talk, we'll look at evidence from the founders on what they felt the Article 5 Convention was for. And then most importantly, we really don't have to wait for an amendment to start fixing the problems our nation's facing today. So to begin with, that's not what happened. Section here, the 1787 precedent. It's already been discussed a couple times. There's things that haven't been mentioned, though. So what really did happen in 1787? Was it a runaway convention or not? To quote the gentleman who was here before me, Mark Meckler, this was on a radio show he did in Idaho just a couple of weeks ago. And he says, all of the state delegate commissions, except for one, had this language in it. The commissioner has any and all authority necessary to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. 
So these guys had all authority. That's his position. Now, I have a copy of the delegate commissions here. And I've gone through them in great detail. In fact, I produce a little chart here that says exactly what each one of them does and doesn't say, what authority was given, what was withheld, and so on. There's a problem with this statement. First of all, this language is not exactly correct. That empowering language at the beginning doesn't exist in it. The commission has any and all authority. It never says that in any of them. They do talk about rendering the federal constitution adequate in, as I recall it was 10 out of the 12, have something like that language. You're assigned to render the federal constitution adequate. And as Bob Menges earlier said, the uh, constitution that they're speaking of there was the Articles of Confederation. So they're being told you need to render the, the Articles of Confederation adequate. Now interestingly, that term, render the federal constitution adequate, is that a broad grant of unlimited power when it is followed by limitations on power? That doesn't make sense, does it? We don't grant unlimited power and then say, except you can't do the following things. For example, some of them had things like, we must preserve term limits on Congress. You can't change that. We have to have the states continue to have a recall power over the members of Congress. Equal vote per state, per state in Congress. As you probably are aware, none of those were retained when the new constitution was formed. So yes, specific limitations were imposed upon their delegates. The delegates and the states writing these commissions recognized that render the constitution adequate was not intended to be a broad grant of unlimited authority. And then there's the other point that they all concluded with how this should be then ratified. Most of the states declared that the existing Article 13 ratification process needs to be preserved. Michael Ferris, who was quoted earlier, even he admits a clear majority of the states insisted that any amendment coming from the Constitutional Convention would have to be approved by the Articles of Confederation method of ratification. All 13 state legislatures and Congress would have to approve it. And just as a quick side note, Congress actually never did approve. In fact, according to, according to Richard Henry Lee, a member of Congress at the time, the way he described it is they chose to transmit the new constitution out to the states without approval or disapproval. Congress never voted to approve the new constitution nor the new ratification process. Interesting history there. But I, what I want to really get into was, frankly, it was the question that was asked by uh, Representative Stuart Jones, I believe. I think he said something about uh, if the delegates had reservations about the scope of their authority. The handout that I've given to you is documented evidence of that, those reservations that they had. If you look at it, the side that says page one at the top here, the first column is some of those reservations that were raised. When they began the convention, they recognized we're proposing a new constitution, not just revising the Articles of Confederation, and a new form of government. Objections were raised in that 1787 convention. I'll touch on just a few of them. Patrick Henry, this was thereafter as an anti-federalist saying that they exceeded their power was perfectly clear. The state ratifying convention thereafter, Robert Whitehill also points it out, that they set aside the laws under which they were appointed. They've overthrown the government to which they were called to amend. From the convention itself, William Patterson, let us return to our states and obtain larger powers and not assume them of ourselves. We don't have the authority to do this. We better go back to the states and get permission first. That was his objection. Charles Pinckney and, and Elbridge Gerry both raised similar concerns as well. John Lansing was so concerned about the delegate commissions, limitations that he left the convention did not return. And Luther Martin, delegate from Maryland. This one's interesting. It's the last one on that first column on your paper there. We apprehended but one reason to prevent the states meeting again in a convention, that when they discovered the part this convention had acted, and how much its members were abusing the trust reposed to them, the states would never trust another convention. Here we are over 230 years later, and guess what? He's right. <laughs> the states have never trusted another national amending convention like 1787. Now that was one side. Now in most political issues that are heated, there are at least two sides of the argument, right? 
So now let's go to this, the other side. This one I would sum up as we don't have the power and we should not proceed before getting more power. The next side of the argument, people like Edmund Randolph. There are great seasons when persons with limited powers are justified in exceeding them. Is he saying they have limitless authority? Absolutely not. The statement from Mark Meckler earlier is not sustained by his view, at least. He does not see their delegate commissions as unlimited authority, but that we have justification in exceeding them. That's the second part of Edmund Randolph's at the top of column two for you on the handout. Alexander Hamilton, to rely on and propose a plan not adequate to these exigencies, the urgent needs of the time, merely because it was not clearly within our powers would be to sacrifice the means to the end. He's again admitting, you're right, we probably do not have the authority in our state commissions, but that we need to do it anyway. James Madison talks about unauthorized propositions. He's again admitting it. And this one's interesting, James Wilson. Again, both during the convention and afterwards in the state ratifying conventions, this issue came up again and again. Did the convention really have the authority? Now, in the Pennsylvania Ratification Convention, this charge came up, and here's how James Wilson defended their actions. This is his response to those saying, you didn't have the authority, the convention did exceed, or as we call it today, run away. And his answer was, the federal convention did not act at all upon the powers given to them by their states. Now, for your convenience, at the bottom of the page, I've given citations because I want you to be able to look up the references and the context of every one of these statements. Because, as John Adams said famously, facts are stubborn things. And I'm convinced if you look up the history and read the various references and their context, you'll recognize there was two sides of the argument. One saying, we don't have the authority, we shouldn't proceed. One side saying, you're right, we don't have the authority, we need to do it anyway. What about the third side, Meckler's, Meckler's point here? It's clearly authorized in the state, convention, in state commissions, the delegate commissions. You know, I've searched and I've challenged the other side to provide any citations from the 1787 convention. Any delegate who, when this controversy came up, raised the statement saying, look at our commissions, we have the authority, let's move forward. The answer so far has been crickets. <laughs> Nothing. There is not a single delegate in the 1787 convention that you could quote them supporting that argument, that they had full authority. This is a modern historical revision. It doesn't exist in 1787. So no, the runaway convention idea of 1787 was not formed in the 1900s, mid-1900s. It was formed at the convention in 1787 by the delegates themselves. And contrary to what Mr. Meckler said, it's not outlandish or slandering the founding fathers to take their word <coughs> for what happened in 1787. But I need to put this in proper context. What authority did they feel they were using? What did they say was the authority they were acting on? Because there was this great divide. How was it resolved? those who said we shouldn't proceed without the authority and those who said we need to. Madison summed it up very well. This is directly from him in the 1787 convention where he said, the people were in fact the fountain of all power. And by resorting to them, all difficulties were got over. They could alter constitutions as they pleased. That's a key point. Again, he's not supporting the argument of we have full authority. He's saying, by resorting to the people, we don't need to obey the limits of power we were given by our states. How did they do that? How did they resort to the people? By changing the ratification method. That they would bypass Congress and the state legislatures and go directly to the people themselves represented in conventions. And in some states like Rhode Island, the people literally were the convention. Every voter in Rhode Island had a vote on the new constitution, on ratification. The entire body of the people was the convention. That was the best way they saw to get the higher authority of the people themselves to approve or, pro to approve or disapprove what their commissions did not really authorize them to do. Again, this is historical fact. Facts are stubborn things. <clears throat> 
The history of 1787 clearly is that of a convention that overstepped its commissions and did so legitimately by appealing to the power of the people. One last quote on, under the third column there, which I don't have my slides, but I just want to bring up. Judge Caleb Wallace, one of our first Supreme Court justices under the Constitution, supporter of the new Constitution, but he was so concerned about the precedent that was set by this runaway convention that he was pushing for, we need to do over. We need to do this entire convention over again, this time with full authority granted by the states and as you see in the quote there, he says, it was done by men who exceeded their commission, whatever may be pleaded in excuse of the necessity of the case, because that was their argument, was necessary. Something certainly can be done to disclaim the dangerous precedent. Any student of the 1787 convention, you run across all these different statements and nothing to support Meckler's argument, you start to realize that he's not right. What he's saying is not true history. So with that, interestingly, state courts, state supreme courts, have consistently upheld this same precedent. What did the 1787 convention say as the precedent? That the convention ultimately represented who? The people, not the states. And we see this again and again with state conventions ever after. In fact, this is summed up in Corpus Juris Secundum. Five different state, courts are, state court rulings are cited. It says the members of a constitutional convention are the direct representatives of the people. And as such, they may exercise all sovereign powers that are vested in the people of the state. They derive their powers not from the legislature, but from the people. And hence, their power may not, in any respect, be limited or restrained by the legislature. This is on page two for you, by the way. It's at the top of the page. Again, I want you to be able to look up references and check them for yourself. So states have consistently held the precedent set by 1787. In fact, the lower portion I won't go into on page two, a bunch of other examples of state conventions bucking against the idea that the state legislatures could restrain them, successfully so. There's a long history of conventions not being able to be restrained. Now, of course, this isn't something Mr. Meckler is going to talk about because it undermines the whole claim that you can control the convention, that state legislators determine what the scope will be. History and court precedent are clearly saying otherwise. Now, another interesting point here, many states across the country have been convinced you can apply for a convention for a limited topic, term limits, balanced budget, or whatever else. Nevada, for example, had applied for the balanced budget amendment application. And here's some of what they say. That they had applied for it with the understanding their application was based upon the representation that the convention would be limited to proposing a balanced budget amend amendment to the Constitution. This was the understanding upon which we based our application. And they later learned this is not true. In fact, they go on to say, our application was therefore induced by fraud. Now, that's some strong words, not mine. And so they then issued a rescission of their application. Subsequently, it went through House committee, House floor unanimously in both. Senate committee and Senate floor, floor unanimously as well, rescinding all applications for an Article 5 convention. When they learned the truth that a convention based on history and legal precedent cannot be limited and it represents the people, not the states, they realized they'd made an error and rescinded their applications. Next I want to get into what is the purpose of Article 5 and specifically the Article 5 convention. In my household, we have a few rules to keep my kids in check. One of them is use things for their intended purpose. That saves a lot of pain, a lot of damage to things. <laughs> <laughs> I was toying between using the hammering a nail with a gun and the guy who was mowing his hedge with a lawnmower, holding it up on top of the hedge. Either way, using things in ways they weren't designed to be used can be dangerous. What was Article 5 actually for according to the founders? 
They claim it's for reining in the federal government when they blatantly ignore the Constitution, when they violate the Constitution, and it's the only way. And yet no founding father ever said that. I'll skip over the quote here for a moment. What they did talk about was, for example, Am Alexander Hamilton saying it was for supplying for any defects that may be found in the Constitution. Obviously, if there's a flaw in the Constitution, the remedy is to amend it, to correct it. Madison said it was for the amendment of errors. Now, one that was cited earlier, Madison's letter to Edward Everett. This one's interesting. Should the provisions of the Constitution, as here reviewed, be found not to secure the government and rights of the states against usurpation and abuses? What's he blaming? What was the fault there that allowed it? Provisions of the Constitution being flawed. So again, we're looking at provisions of the Constitution are flawed, then we need to amend the Constitution. This is elementary. And usurpation and abuses could be the cause of that, or it could just be they're blatantly ignoring it. That's another one he'll take up in a moment. George Washington's famous farewell address says the same type of thing. If the distribution or modification of constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, let it be corrected by the amendment process, as the Constitution designates. Now, what about correcting breaches or violations of the Constitution? Madison addresses that as well. You're all probably familiar with the Federalist Papers, where Madison, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton express the meaning and intent of the Constitution in a way that has been looked to by the Supreme Court ever since as official explanation of the Constitution and its intent. In Federalist 49, it's almost like he's writing a time capsule letter to us to this committee right now. Because <laughs> he's addressing this question, is this what Article 5 should be used for? For correcting breaches of the Constitution when they ignore it? And his answer, the convention, is, in short, would be composed chiefly of men who had been, or actually were, or expected to be members of the department whose conduct was to be arraigned. In other words, the troublemakers will probably be your delegates or the same type of people. The passions, therefore, not the reason of the public will sit in judgment. To put this in modern words, I'd say it simply, if we are having trouble electing members of Congress to uphold the Constitution, what kind of delegates do we expect we're going to get? Same type. That's Madison's argument. And then at the end of Federalist 49, he ties it back into Federalist 48, saying this also applies to this topic. Because in Federalist 48, he talks about trusting in parchment barriers. Can we put up pieces of paper, rules, and expect they're going to enforce themselves? Or is there something more needed? The conclusion, he says, I'm warranted in drawing from these observations, is that a mere demarcation on parchment of the constitutional limits of the several departments is not sufficient guard against those encroachments which leads to the tyrannical concentration of all powers of government in the same hands. What's he saying in these two Federalist Papers? I feel like he's speaking to us right now, today. Simply creating new rules is not the solution to rules that have not been enforced. <coughs> it really comes down to constitutional enforcement. In fact, you read through the Federalist Papers, and that's where we're going next. They gave many examples of how to restrain the federal government, how to keep them in the box. In fact, it's one of the most common topics talked about in Federalist Papers. How to keep the federal government in the constitutional bounds. Don't just trust the parchment barriers to do it for you. So the founders' real solutions. For this, to introduce this section, I want to go back to two years ago last week in Boise, Idaho. Legal counsel for the Convention of States, Robert Kelly, was there presenting, here's why we need the Article 5 Convention, we need to pass this, this application. And someone asks him, so what happens when we change the Constitution and they still don't follow it? His answer, millions of activists will need to be involved in pressuring legislators and litigation will be required to enforce the changes. He's talking about constitutional enforcement there, isn't he? Even once we change the Constitution, we're still going to need to rally together to enforce it. The member of the audience who asked the question, follow-up question, so why don't we just skip amending the Constitution and enforce it now? <laughs> and he didn't really have an answer. He just got agitated and then moved on. But the point here is this. The majority of things they're seeking in, the in, in their amendments of the Constitution are already in there. Balanced budget amendments are necessary if we adhere to the enumerated powers. In fact, by my numbers, I would estimate that it would trim the federal budget by somewhere between 70 to 80% cut 
and you'd have an excess of about a $2.3 trillion annual surplus by today's revenue numbers if we were to follow what the Constitution actually authorizes in spending. Now, granted, that's a huge leap from where we are now, and I don't expect something like that to be accomplished overnight. But I will show you how it can be accomplished without amending the Constitution. So according to the Founding Fathers, in fact, Madison, this is one of my favorite things he addresses, Federalist 44, as state legislators, why are you required to swear an oath of office to the federal Constitution? What does the federal Constitution have to do with a governor or state legislator or other state officers? And his answer is that it's the job of the states to giving effect to the Constitution. That's interesting. Most of us didn't realize that, that the job of the states is to be that first line of defense in enforcing, giving effect to the Constitution. They say this over and over again throughout the Federalist Papers. Federalist 46 is a great one. The means of opposition are powerful and at hand. Schemes of usurpation will easily be defeated by the state governments. Did we know that that was the job of the state governments? To defeat usurpation of the federal? Again, Federalist Papers, these are the instructions on how this Constitution is supposed to work. We haven't been following it. Federalist 33, great one by Hamilton. And mind you, Hamilton was the big government advocate among the founders, and even he was advocating these things. He says, acts of the federal government not pursuant to the Constitution, or its constitutional powers, are merely acts of usurpation and will deserve to be treated as such. The rest of these talk about how you do that. How do we treat these usurpations as they truly are? One, he suggests in Federal 16, if the cooperation of the state legislatures be necessary to give effect to the measure of the union, the states have only not to act or to act evasively and the measure is defeated. This has been repeatedly upheld by the Supreme Court, by the way. It's called the anti-commandeering doctrine that the states cannot be forced to use their resources to implement federal acts and federal law. You're at perfect liberty and the courts have already backed that repeatedly. Additionally, Madison says, refusal to cooperate with the officers of the union. Same, top, same topic, same concept. They can also go further. This is a little more aggressive now. Creating legislative devices to present obstructions which the federal government would be hardly willing to encounter. So they could actually outlaw certain things. It's illegal. For example, the Real ID Act of 2005, numerous states said it's illegal to implement this in our state. And for quite a while stood their ground. If they continue to stand their ground, they'd still have that boundary. It's happened numerous times. In fact, this concept of states intervening, some call it interposition or even nullification, whatever you want to call it, it has been used hundreds of times in our nation's history. It's not the solution, but it's one part of it. It's one arrow in the quiver, so to speak. In fact, Madison addresses this concept as well. Some people claim the states have no right. This is lawlessness. Do the states have a right to interpose, as it's repeatedly <coughs> suggested throughout the Federalist Papers? He says if they didn't, that would be a plain denial of the fundamental principle upon which our independence was declared. If you believe the states don't have the right to intervene. We're denying the very principle upon which we declared our independence. But notice what it says in the bolded section right in the middle there. That to do so is to preserve the Constitution itself. That is the job of the states, to help preserve the Constitution. Now, it's a great honor to be speaking, no irony here, in the state of South Carolina, where just last year there was a, a bill introduced. You're really leading the nation. There are now three states that have introduced a similar bill. Oklahoma and Texas as well, declaring that we ought to form a committee in, this, in the legislature that simply reviews federal law and makes suggestions on how the state should react to them. If there's a federal law that clearly has no constitutional authority, what are the suggestions on how we should respond? Simply not helping implement it, let the states, let the federal government do it on their own or whatever, or actually actively resist. Interesting. So my hat's off to you here leading the nation in, in this regard. Additionally, on the, the next power I want to talk about is more powerful than the power of the states to resist and, and block unconstitutional federal law. This is the power of the people. As Madison said earlier, the people being the source of, or the fountain of all power. The people have tremendous power. Madison calls us the ultimate redress 
I love this word, the disquietude of the people. Another word we don't use much anymore. About the only time I do is when I'm giving this presentation. <laughs> disquietude, the people are getting upset about your performance in office. It means your chances for re-election are starting to go down. There's a problem we need to be addressed. That is important. In fact, I'm going to show you just how powerful that can be in a moment here. We can also, of course, elect more faithful representatives. There's always the vote. And if that's the only thing we do, it's really not enough. Just simply voting for good people is not enough. Usurpation requires the concurrence of the courts and the people. Here's my favorite one. Again, from Hamilton, Federal 16. He refers to the people as the natural guardians of the Constitution. But in order to be that, the first part of the quote, we need to be a people enlightened enough to distinguish between a legal exercise and an illegal usurpation of authority. What that means simply is we need to be able to recognize when the Constitution is being violated. We need to know it well enough. For that reason, I take time away from my business quite regularly to travel the country and teach the Constitution. Am I running out here? Okay, I'm almost there. Thank you. I'll skip this next quote here just for the interest of time. But this last year when I was on a speaking tour in Arkansas, I had a wonderful visit with the Lieutenant Governor, Tim Griffin. As a former mem member of Congress, he shared with me something that surprised me. He said, the most surprising thing I learned as a member of Congress is how responsive Congress is to the will of their people. And I'd never thought that was the case. I, said, I was thinking, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> and he says, for example, take the national push for a balanced budget. That's generally supported by a majority of the Americans. But Congress doesn't do it. Are they not being responsive or what's going on here? And his answer was, Yes, they want the balanced budget, but they don't want it more. They don't want it more than various federal programs and handouts and things of that nature. The moment that changes, Congress will immediately balance the budget. That was his words. I would take that to the states as well, where, as mentioned earlier, about 31%, 32% of this state's budget this year is federally funded. How well do you think we'd go over if any one of you introduced a bill saying we're now going to reject all federal funding starting next fiscal year? Does that have much chance of passing? Probably not. The state of South Carolina is not ready to do their part in let's fully restrain the federal government back to its constitutional bounds. We have a ways to go here, state by state. To say we're going to pass a balanced budget amendment through a convention when the states and the people are really not ready for the consequences that would require is unrealistic. Now last, I just want to share a brief example of disquietude of the people because this is so effective. The, this was my congressman, Denny Reberg from Montana. And the Freedom Index is one score, that, it's a scorecard comparing congressmen to the Constitution, how well they follow the Constitution as intended, as opposed to how inter it's interpreted by the courts. And as you can see by his history there, he's generally right in the middle of ground, right around 50% average. I moved there and I began launching what we call the Constitutional Enforcement Program. We called it the Power of 500. I pulled together hundreds of people, in fact it was a little less than 200, and spreading his voting record at every opportunity. And within just a few months, it was about four to five months, the next scorecard came out and he was at an 80 percent. The next one he was at 80, and the next one he was at 90, and the next one he's 90, and then he decided to run for a different office and we have to start over again. But that job is never done. But notice, just a couple hundred people were enough to get his attention and get him following the Constitution, not as interpreted by the Supreme Court, like the large book that Meckler brought up earlier references, but as intended, because that was what we were holding him to. He followed the Constitution as intended, regardless of any Supreme Court decisions authorizing otherwise. Now, I just want to put out a little thought to those that are here supporting an Article 5 convention. With less than 200 people, we fixed one congressman in one congressional district. Take Convention of States, for example, they, they claim they have 4.3 million activist supporters. You divide that by 435 congressional districts, that averages about 10,000 per congressional district. If I could, with a, around 200 or let's change the Constitution, why don't we enforce it now? <laughs>
as was said in that meeting in Boise, Idaho two years ago. Why don't we rally together on the same side instead of fighting each other and enforce the Constitution today? We have the power. We just need to stand up and demand it. I'd say it's time to defend the Constitution, not amend it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> the members have uh, questions? Any of the committee members have questions? Must be a commentary on a thorough presentation if nobody has questions. Then. <laughs> or I put you all to sleep, one of the two. <laughs> Josiah, Josiah. One, one second, Mr. Magnuson. I, I did make a few notes. I wanted to make sure you were saying the Article 5 ultimately could not be, con and I don't want to put words in your mouth. Go ahead. I, I was yeah. taking notes. Could not be limited because it is based on the power of the people. If Correct. I understood that correct. Correct. And, Historical and it, precedent okay. shows and I, that. They that's where the authority the lies. It doesn't lie from us, it lies from the people as a whole. Correct. Right. Okay, and then I heard at the end you saying that the power of the people at the ballot box is yet another opportunity or the scorecard to, right. to, to rein government in. Um, so if the, if the people's power is written in the Constitution in Article 5, why should we not embrace giving more people the chance to, to address those issues without being muddied by the legislative process. And that might not be real articulate, but <laughs> you know, I'm trying to say, you're saying that it seems to me you've just taken the people and plugged them directly into the constitutional concerns that they have. Right. Why would we not want to avail ourselves to that? Do we not trust the people to make good decisions uh, with the exercise of that I, honestly, authority? I, I love your question. It's a great question because as I've traveled around the country and I teach classes on the Constitution, one of my favorite things to do, and maybe it's the, the professor in me. My father's a, a professor at uh, a university. And I, I like to do a pop quiz. And generally, people that are going to show up, take time out of their evening to come to a lecture on the US Constitution already have some understanding. They're not the average citizen. And my pop quiz, 10 questions on the Constitution, and I think the high score I've seen so far is seven out of 10 of, of thousands of people that have taken it across the country. Generally a little disappointed. Now my, my uh, 12 year old daughter was on tour with me one time and by the third night of hearing me give the quiz, she was getting a 10 out of 10. But, <laughs> but honestly, when we're proposing changing the constitution that we don't know, we risk doing more damage. I often compare it to inviting love poets to do heart surgery. If you don't truly understand the workings of the Constitution as you cut into it, you're likely to do damage. It was earlier mentioned that uh, the Convention of States held this convention simulation a couple years ago, 2016 actually, and they came up with various amendment proposals. There's one in there that I think is a great example of that problem because it wants to, it references federal law, whether passed by Congress, the President, or the administrative agencies. Does anyone see a problem with having that kind of language in an amendment? Yeah. Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1, right after the preamble. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress. Congress. We know what the word all means. <laughs> yeah, the word all. If all legislative powers in Congress, how much does that leave to the president, the administrative agencies? None. Unless we have an amendment that says federal law passed by Congress, the president, or the administrative agency. We just accidentally are granting authority to the president to create law. Now the, the intent was granting the states the power to overturn federal law passed by any of those categories. But in the process of trying to give the states more power to overturn federal law, they're giving the president the power to create it. And this is just an example. It's not ill intent, I don't believe, but just ignorance. Now, my delegation from my state voted no, because <laughs> they were more informed on that topic. They, they knew exactly where I would stand on it if they, if, if they were talking to me about it. But I feel that ignorance is the biggest danger we have today. And so on the other hand, it's, I feel it's far safer to rally the people behind enforcing what we already have rather than risking changes in ignorance. And this, Does that answer this, your question? Yes, sir. I, I believe so. I, and this may tie into what Mr. Magnuson is going to ask because you had a scorecard in which you were watching how they made constitutional decisions. Right. But I also heard you say, not as interpreted by the Supreme Court, but so who, who decides 
what's constitutional? Because didn't our Constitution, I'm getting a little in and over my head here, didn't sure. our Constitution tell us that the Supreme Court was there to interpret the Constitution, whether we agree with it or not? So now the same citizens you said weren't educated enough to make these decisions, you're now saying they should stand outside the Supreme Court and look and, and decide what's constitutional. That is the role of the people because we're the grantors of the commission. In Even fact, though we're not educated enough to do and it. And that's the that problem. We're not living right. up to our role. It, it is in Federalist 49 where Madison refers to the people as the grantors of the Constitution Commission, as the ultimate deciders on whether or not it's being followed. But the problem there is that we have not been up to our task, have we? As, as we've discussed earlier. <laughs> and so here's the thing, though. The most interesting thing is I've traveled the country as a promoter and teacher of the Constitution, I meet a lot of other constitutional scholars. And the degree in which we disagree on the meaning of the Constitution is so infinitesimally small, it's astounding to me. Because when you have a number of people who come from the standpoint of what was the intent, if we read the 1787 convention notes for Madison, for example, where you read about they're considering adding this language, here's what it would mean if we added it and so on, then you read the Federalist Papers backing it up and explaining it, we come to the same conclusion again and again and again on what the Constitution actually means. I think the problem is you're agreeing with that Constitution, the one that they gave Correct. us, not the big one that we keep seeing Correct. presented up here. I want to be respectful of people's time. Mr. Magnuson's recognized. And can I make one quick comment on that before we go on, if you don't mind? Just one quick side note, and that is that the Constitution actually never gave the Supreme Court the authority to be the final arbiter of what the Constitution means. Their authority was to apply to the cases before them. So they're not to create new constitutional meaning and, and precedent in that regard. Side note, we could spend another half hour on that topic, but we'll move on. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, I'll be brief, and, uh, but uh, Mr. Brown, thank you so much for coming. And thank um, I think the, uh, the testimony there was very uh, profound and uh, professional, and I just appreciate your, um, your being here all the way from Montana and, uh, and sharing all that history with us. Um, I have just a couple questions. Um, first of all, we heard earlier about, uh, from some of the, the uh, pro promoters of the convention issue, about the Second Amendment and that um, that would not be on the agenda at all or, or would not be able to be addressed um, at this kind of convention. Do you want to speak to that? I know that's a concern that, that I've had and many others that sure. the Second Amendment could be, you know, a addressed or, or clarified in some way. What would, how would you address? Is that a concern you have as well? Actually, it really is. In fact, um, let me jump to a slide here. So I have others in reserve here. Uh, Convention of States, for example, has repeatedly published things like this, saying that the Second Amendment's not on the table, it's not on the agenda, assuring us of that kind of concern. Because, rightly so, that would be a concern. And in fact, Mick Mr. Meckler, a few minutes ago, was up here talking about how you're not going to find 38 states that support a repeal of the Second Amendment. And I, I agree, that's probably true. In this one, this article point out, point out a few of its key points. Second Amendment's not on the agenda. Here's what the agenda is. So that's their, their argument. Now, the interesting thing is they don't always agree with themselves. Because also recently, on the Convention of States official Facebook page, the question was raised, why don't we include an update to the Second Amendment in this Convention of States convention? Gun control advocates wear out the point that was written when people only had muskets, so why not make it read the way we want to read now? And their answer was rather surprising. It's called a clarification clause, and that's very much on the agenda of any number of the study groups that are currently being conducted around the country composed of Convention of States Project advocates and their state legislators. So on the one hand, they're saying it's not on the agenda, and then in this case, they're saying it is on the agenda. It doesn't fit within the scope of the convention's application. In this case, they're saying it does. I have to ask the question, if we interpret their convention application narrowly, then it probably wouldn't be on the convention's scope, would it? On this case, this looks like they're interpreting it rather broadly. If they interpret it that broadly, I have a hard time finding things I couldn't fit within the scope of their convention application. On the other hand, if we're interpreting it narrowly, then they're already talking about running away with their own convention. Either way, this also brings me to what I think is more likely to happen. That I don't see an outright repeal, maybe a clarification of the, Constitution, or of the Second Amendment, as advocated here by former Supreme Court Justice. I can get to the right slide here. 
Somehow this is, my slide isn't working, I apologize. But here's the article you can see behind the quote there. An article written by Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, in which he's talking about five words that can fix the Second Amendment. And his suggestion is that the Second Amendment has gotten out of hand, and what its real intent was, we're going to fix by adding just five words, not repealing. The right of the people to keep and bear arms while serving in the militia shall not be infringed. That's not a repeal, and yet it does repeal the recognition of my right to keep and bear arms. I don't see a massive repeal of the Second Amendment, but I do see compromises. I do see a lot of more conservative states opening themselves to common sense gun control measures and things like that. So it's not absolutely out of the question. I do have concerns with that. Thank you. And thank you. And I'm going to let you sit down. But so the three categories that we had before is fiscal restraints on federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of federal government, limit the terms of office. Um, in order to, to even touch the Second Amendment in any of these categories, um, it would have to be, you'd have to jump outside of, of and, and I've understood the yeah. whole debate on how you could or could not jump outside, but clearly it wouldn't be within the confines at least of what is being proposed. Now, whether that by, can be by enforced. those three topics. Correct. I, I actually see it's pretty easy to fit within the three topics. The really? power and jurisdiction of the federal government regarding firearms shall be limited to the following. And now you're under the power and jurisdiction clause. And I find it hard to find any amendment I couldn't fit by adding such language at the beginning. The power and jurisdiction of the federal government under this topic shall be limited to. This big thing. And then anything right. that follows right. is germane right. to their application. Thank you. Thank so any, it's pretty I'm, wide open as far as I see it. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Any, any more members? Any questions? Ms. Magnuson, you good? Thank you. Ms. Thayer, you good? Right. Thank, you. Thank you, sir, for your time. We appreciate you being here. Thank you here. very much. Laird.